Gracious and loving God, it is good to be together in your presence today. As we gather in this place, we give you thanks for bringing us here, for bringing us together. And God, as we open up our Bibles this morning and as we dive into what it means to be in exile, give us ears to hear what you have for us. And God, I ask that you would take my words and use them for your glory. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So over the last few months, we've spent a lot of time in in the Hebrew scriptures. And we've been introduced to a pattern that, that tends to repeat itself over and over again in the Old Testament. God creates. God lives in right relationship with God's creation. Something happens. God's people are distracted. God's people turn away to some sort of idolatry. And then that relationship is broken. And as a result, the people are left kind of wandering, trying to figure things out on the way. And over time, God shows grace, gathers up the remnant of the faithful, usually through the the nudging of a leader or the nudging of, of a prophet. And then the cycle repeats itself. Now, for those of you who are following along in the story and and reading along through this kind of narrative, this this chronological narrative of of Scripture, I know you're probably in this place where you're sitting there thinking, how long, how long, O Lord, are we going to be in this cycle? And I encourage you not to hurry through. We had a staff meeting this last week, and I said, you know, sometimes we hurry through the difficult parts of Scripture. But I want to invite us to to sit in some of that discomfort, sit in some of that parts of scripture that, you know, it, it, it doesn't quite feel good. It's okay because when we sit in those places, it helps us to understand the whole narrative and to see that that scripture is full of hope throughout all parts of God's word. Sometimes we need to sit in these places. And so hang in there, and if you're in one of those places where you're saying, how long, how long, don't worry, we have four more weeks in the Old Testament. Four more weeks in the Old Testament. And the reality is today's story actually uh, moves the needle a, a little bit toward, toward what's coming. It moves the needle a little bit towards the, the hope that we find throughout God's word. We're in this place where Jerusalem has been captured, where, where most of God's people are, are living in exile. And so we read the stories of, of Daniel who remains steadfast to his identity as one of God's chosen people in the face of intense persecution, in the face of a a foreign place where nobody really believes the same thing that he believes. And the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who, who stand up and stand firm against King Nebuchadnezzar and say, no, 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 this is who we are. This is what God is about. This is what we believe. And in the middle of that, there's this nuance in this part of of Scripture where we see God glorified in Babylon, outside of the walls of Jerusalem, away from the temple. As Pastor John said last week, the Babylonian exile forces God's people to understand God in a new way, where Yahweh isn't just connected to geography. Now, if you were to read the book of Jeremiah from from start to finish, you'd see that it's a story that unfolds over about 40 years. It covers the last days of Judah, the last days of Jerusalem, and the beginning of the Babylonian captivity. Now, Babylon's leaders, they were smart. They knew they could force Judah's leaders, that they couldn't force Judah's leaders, excuse me, to, to assimilate to their culture. But if they could... If they could get the the, the people who had influence in Judah's culture to assimilate, then everyone else would follow, even if it took a few generations to get there. So when they conquer Jerusalem, they leave the people who have no influence in the city of Jerusalem, and they bring those who do have influence, the diplomats, the officials, the skilled workers, the clergy, they bring them all to Babylon. They bring them all to Babylon. And Jeremiah is one of the few who's left in Jerusalem. And what we're about to read is a letter that he sends to those who are exiled in Babylon, to his friends who are exiled in Babylon. And we'll see that it's 
almost as though if he sees a, a future for the people who live in Babylon, that God has given them this vision for the people who live in Babylon that, that's full of hope. That there's hope outside of Jerusalem. Starting in, in Jeremiah 29.4, we read this. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile for Jerusalem to Babylon. Who, who carried the people into exile? God. God. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper and not to harm you, plans to give you hope for a future. Then you will listen, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the kindest and, and warmest people I've ever met is a man named Walter. Walter joined the church that I grew up in when I was about nine or ten, and from the moment he entered the community, he made an impact. Whenever, was, was out on the, on, whenever Walter was out on the courtyard, you couldn't miss him. Walter was this, this tall man, probably 6'4", six, 6'5", six, tall, skinny man from Uganda with one of the warmest and most memorable smiles I have ever, ever seen. I only see him every couple of years now, but somehow, whenever we see one another, he knows how to make me feel right at home. Again, I only see him every couple of years, and he'll come up and he'll say, how are your kids? How... how is your wife? How is your church? How are your studies? Somehow he knows all these things about me, even though I haven't seen him for a couple of years. He's one of those people who you can be standing in a, a group of hundreds of people around, and when he's there with you, he makes you feel like you are the only person that matters. Do any of you know someone like that? Who just, just kind of, when you're with them, you, you, you feel... Like, like you belong. Now, Walter's story is incredible. He moved to California after fleeing from his home in Uganda to Kenya. He witnessed some, some pretty horrible things. And his experience as a refugee compelled him to help other refugees. He started an organization called Alliance for African Assistance. And before long, he realized that there was a gap between what the government provides for refugees and, and what the needs of displaced people actually are. So imagine you arrive in a new place for the first time, usually because something terrible is happening in your home country. If you're lucky, you might speak a little bit of the language to the new place that you're in. But you don't know how anything works. Public transportation, school systems, doctors, stores, anything. I'll never forget the story that Walter told me of a family of five who had recently moved to Southern California and uh, an organization like his helped them get set up with an apartment, a two-bedroom apartment and with, with some furniture. And he was doing kind of a, a check-in two months later. And he stopped into their house and they had a, all, all the furniture you'd find in a normal apartment. And out on the table were sitting eggs and milk. And he, and he walked in and he said, why, 
why are your eggs and milk on the table? And they said, well, that's where we keep them. And he looked over to the fridge and he said, they, they need to be in the refrigerator. They had never used a refrigerator before. And they live in a country where the pasteurization process is, is different. So eggs and milk aren't, aren't refrigerated. These are the sorts of challenges that a lot of the refugees that he deals with are experiencing, just learning how to function in the world in which we live. A few years back, Walter was interviewed by the BBC and, and he said, I miss my home, but I feel like I can do a lot of good right here. I truly believe that this was a plan of God, that God brought me here, and now I can see why. Now on a massive scale, Walter is doing what Jeremiah called the exiles in Babylon to do. He's working to help others find wholeness, find completeness in the place where he's been exiled. In the place where he's been exiled. And though most of us aren't refugees like Walter, we too are called to seek that same sort of peace and wholeness for our neighbors, for our, our community. Every single day. We might not live in a place that feels as foreign as a, a completely new country, but there's no doubt in my mind that there are parts of our world today that, that, that make us all feel a little bit uncomfortable. It's pretty daunting if you think about it with how much American culture has shifted over the last few years in a relatively short period of time. Now some of us see those shifts as good things, some of us see those shifts as bad things, and some of us are, are in the middle with them. But no matter where we stand, we can't deny that the world around us has changed and continues to change at an astonishing rate. And as a result, many of our churches, the world around us has changed, and as a result, many of our, our, our churches look different today than they did when they were first planted, when they first started. Those of you who have been around WPC for the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years know that that's the case. You can attest to that truth. Yes, the church today looks different than it did 20, 30, 40 years ago. So how do we respond? How do we respond to the changes? How do we respond to the needs in our, in our community, the new needs? Jeremiah's letter to his friends in Babylon give us a few ideas. First, through Jeremiah, God tells the exiles to plant roots. They're encouraged to build homes, to move in, to plant gardens, to eat from those gardens, to have their children marry locals. The message is you're going to be here a while. You might as well settle down. Don't fight it. Babylon was a, an urban city that was about 800 miles outside of Jerusalem. Most of the people in Judah and Israel would have seen it as a very dirty place. They, they wouldn't go there. The Babylonians didn't have the same set of beliefs, didn't have the same set of values. They ate different food. They had different laws. They worshipped what they saw to be idols. It would have been incredibly uncomfortable for God's people to spend any time there, let alone to be exiled there for 70 years. It was a culture in which they, they wouldn't have felt like they belonged. The lesson for us here might be pretty simple and straightforward, but it doesn't make it any less daunting. One of the ways that we can thrive, one of the ways that we can live as the people that God has called us to be now and today is by planting ourselves in places of discomfort. Planting ourselves in places of discomfort. So maybe that means earnestly getting to know, <clears throat> excuse me, the neighbor who has a different faith background. Or maybe it means reaching out to someone from a, a different generation and intentionally getting to know them, to hear their story, to understand how they see the world. Maybe it means committing to serve our shelter, or volunteering with MANA, or with the Westminster Free Clinic. When we allow ourselves to be even just a, a little bit uncomfortable, God tends to show up and do mighty things. 
I read a story this last week about one of the students from, from Parkland who survived the shooting a, a year ago. This last, year, this last week was the, the year anniversary of that. Now, he was one of those, those founding members of the March for Our Lives campaign, and he made a name for himself after kind of uh, dressing down a U.S. politician on national TV. And after a year, he realized that all of the work that he was doing wasn't producing any sort of substantial change. Instead of reaching across the aisle and having fruitful conversations, all he was really doing was exciting those who already agreed with him. All he was really doing was, was stirring the pot of those who were really saw the world in the same way that he did. And so he stepped away from the March for Our Lives campaign. He said, you know what, I, I'm not about just stirring the pot. And now he's taking a different approach. He's planting himself in uncomfortable places and spends more time listening to other perspectives than shouting his own. It's both a testament to this young man's maturity and it's a reminder to us all to step into what's uncomfortable. Then once roots have been planted, the exiles are told to seek the peace and the prosperity or the shalom in the place where they live, in the community. They're called to actively work for that shalom. Now, the Hebrew concept of shalom, it, it, it's kind of all-encompassing wholeness, safety, security, wellness. It means to be complete. So God is asking the people in exile to help make the lives of their captors better. To look at those who completely disrupted their way of life, who took them from their homes, took away everything they knew, everything they loved, and to work toward bringing them peace and wholeness. Now at first glance, it doesn't make sense. But the reality is if the Babylonians thrived, those who were in exile would thrive too. It wasn't just about keeping their head down, laying low, and assimilating to a new culture. It was about bringing God's shalom to people who had have never experienced it if they didn't go into exile in the first place. Now, we weren't planted in Babylon 500 plus years before Jesus was born. Instead, we were planted in the Conejo Valley nearly 2,000 years after Jesus' death. But there is a reason that we are in this place at this time in history. If we weren't here, if the, the 50 or so other churches weren't here as well, our neighbors wouldn't experience what we can bring to them. The reminder here is to not get complacent, to not get, again, too comfortable, to fight the temptation of comfort that plagues really all of Southern California, if we're honest, and to remember that we have important work to do Let's step into the places of discomfort in our communities and bring shalom, wholeness, completeness while we're there. And lastly, Jeremiah tells the exiles to seek God with all of who they are, with all of what they have, with their whole hearts. If they seek God with all their heart, they'll find God no matter where they are, no matter where they go. Now, it would be so easy for them to be distracted by the different culture that was around them, by the, the Babylonian idols that they'd walk around and they'd see all over the place, by, by trying to defend their point of view against the Babylonians' point of view. It would be, be easy to miss God in the middle of it all. The same is true for us today. It's easy to get distracted. Now, many of us in, in the church today spend more time debating with each other than we do actually listening to what God has for us. I think sometimes it's easier to, to listen to that, that gut feeling we have than it is to seek God with all of our heart. Often, we'd rather be right than be convicted by what Scripture says, so we close our Bibles. Or we try to find the one verse that lines up with our worldview and then read scripture through that one verse. 
It doesn't matter if you consider yourself conservative, if you consider yourself progressive. It really doesn't matter. Scripture should challenge us all. Scripture should confront all of our worldviews, no matter where you stand. And it should make us all feel a little uncomfortable. One of the most convicting parts of Jesus' sermon, or of Jesus' teaching for me, is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's when he, he starts talking about worrying. Anyone else want to confess to be a, a bit of a worrier? Maybe a bit of a control freak? Anyone else want to make that confession this morning? So Jesus quickly, quickly moves from encouraging his listeners to not worry about food, about clothes, about, about house, about his house, pretty much everything. Stop worrying about it all. To call his followers to seek God's kingdom and then everything else will be taken care of. <laughs> Easier said than done. Can I get an amen? It's the same sort of message Jeremiah brings to the exiles. And it's one we need to hear as well. God calls the exiles in Babylon to, to plant roots, to work for the shalom of the greater community, and to seek God with all of their hearts. And everything else will be taken care of. It's a message that rings true throughout all of Scripture. That's why we're journeying through the story together, even those difficult parts. And the message should push us to do the same thing. One of the more prominent places in the Gospels where, where Jesus calls his disciples to function in a world in a way that's similar to, to how God calls the exiles to function in Babylon comes in a conversation that, they, that Jesus has with, with, with the disciples and really with Peter in Caesarea Philippi. Now Caesarea Philippi is on the northernmost edge of Israel. It was a city that was given to Herod by the Roman emperor, by Caesar Augustus. But before before it became a place that was kind of known for honoring Caesar, it was a place where the Greek god Pan was worshipped. And before that, there was a temple to the Babylonian god Baal that was there. Or the Canaanite god, I should say, Baal that was there. So Jesus takes, takes the disciples to the edge of this, this different culture, to the edge of this, this different world. And he asks one of the most important questions we find in all of Scripture. That question he asked to Peter is what? Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And the disciples say, some say John the Baptist, others suggest you're a prophet like Elijah, or even Jeremiah. And then Jesus says, what about you? What about you? Who do you say that I am? And Simon confesses, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus responds that Simon will be blessed because of his confession. He renames Simon Peter the Rock. He translates Petros into the Rock. Peter the Rock and says, On this rock I will build my church. Whose church? Jesus' church, my church. It's a well known passage, it's a great passage. It's Peter's confession this is the Messiah, this is who Jesus is, this is who Jesus was. It's an important story. But there's something we miss when we just translate the word that, that, that Matthew uses here for church as church. The, the word that is used in this passage, sorry, it'd be helpful if you could see it. I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. The Greek word for church there is ecclesia. It's the first time that we find it in, in the gospels. Now, I was pointed out this week, this week I was in a, a meeting with other pastors and, and other pastors from our, our community here in the Conejo Valley, and it was pointed out that this is the first time that ecclesia is used in, in the New Testament, and it's true. It is. There are other words that Jesus could have used for church, words that are used in other places earlier in Matthew, like synagogue or gathering, but he doesn't. Again, this is the first place ecclesia is used. And it's significant because ecclesia was strictly a Greek word, it was not a Hebrew concept, it was strictly a Greek concept. It wasn't Jewish, and it certainly wasn't Christian. In classical Greek, 
and ecclesia was an assembly where citizens gathered to make decisions for the rest of the culture. So ecclesia was a place that the citizens came together and said, okay, how are we going to change the world in which we live? See, I think Jesus was, was very poignant in saying ecclesia here instead of using synagogue. Because the call for the disciples wasn't to be a place to just get together and feel good about what they believe. The call to the disciples was to go out and to change the world. To go out and to change the culture. Again, Caesarea Philippi. A world full of different cultures. A world full of of completely different cultures. To a degree, the church was always called to be in exile. Was always called to be uncomfortable. And somehow, along the way, we've forgotten that truth. So my prayer for us is that we would remember that we are a part of the ecclesia that's called to seek the shalom of the many different cultures that surround us here in the Conejo Valley. Starting in Westlake Village, moving into the valley and beyond. Let's pray. Gracious God, help us to be a people who plant roots, who seek the well-being and wholeness of all people in our community, and who seek to follow you with all of our hearts. Pray these things in your name. Amen.